Good morning, almost afternoon. My name is Danielle Diamond, and I'm the Executive Director of the Socially Responsible Agricultural Project. And we have another wonderful panel of experts to talk with you today about trends in the ag animal agriculture industry. And we have Michelle Merkel, who's the co-director of the Food and Water Watch Justice Project, who's also the president of the board of directors of the Social Responsible Agricultural Project. Daisy Freund, who's the director of Farm Animal Welfare at the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty of Animals. Dr. Loka Ashwood, assistant professor at Auburn University with the Department of Agricultural Economics and Rural Sociology and Craig Watts, who's a former contract grower for Purdue and now a regional representative for the Social Responsible Agricultural Project. So the way we wanted to structure this panel uh, is to try to focus the most on the issues that are in the areas that are of most interest to you. And so each of our presenters are going to give you a very brief introduction um, about their backgrounds and work, and then go into a short presentation about the trends that they're seeing in the animal agriculture industry. And then we're hoping to save a lot of time for questions and answers and a discussion. And so, um, so that's how we'll be doing things. So the presentations will be short, and then we'll do a lot of questions and answers, hopefully. So I'm so excited to have everyone here, and so we're very appreciative of having you all. So thank you so much to our speakers. And with that, I will just jump right into our first speaker, Michelle, and I'll step aside and let you take away. Thanks so much, Danny. Um, good afternoon, I'm really happy to be here. I'm Michelle, I'm the co-director of Food and Water Justice at Food and Water Watch. And I'm gonna talk about a trend that Mike mentioned last night. Um, that's a trend towards the liquidation of our natural resources, of our commons. By, uh, the World Bank predicts that by 2025, two-thirds of the world's population will have a shortage of fresh drinking water, which is why Fortune magazine calls water the oil of the 21st century, meaning there's increased interest in the financial sector and big corporations to profit off of your waterways, and the profits are what, gonna, it, what gonna, are going to drive the decision-making about how you use that water not what's best for communities. So I'm gonna talk about the latest uh, market-based scheme for water, we call it water pollution trading, components called nutrient trading or water quality trading. It is a rollback of our federal environmental laws, it is undemocratic and it will only worsen our waterways. So why do I say it's a rollback? The Clean Water Act is our federal environmental law that protects your waterways and it's, been, it's worked pretty well over the last 40 plus years with most regulated sectors except for agriculture, which we'll talk about in a, in a minute. But the reason why it's worked well is there's a permitting prob, uh, program that has strict limits on pollution. Uh, the limits are supposed to be more stringent over time. The goal of the Clean Water Act is get, getting to zero. The permits are pretty transparent. The permittees in most cases are supposed to monitor their discharges every month reports the state whether they're um, in compliance with their permits. If they're not, the states, the feds, and citizens can sue to enforce the permit limits. Trading turns this notion of working towards zero pollution on its head because now instead of working towards eliminating your pollution, you can uh, pollute as much as you can afford to buy. So the way it works is CAFOs, for example, a CAFO could put a buffer strip on its land and argue that it, it reduces pollution by, say, a thousand pounds a year. They can then sell that thousand pounds of pollution, say, for a thousand bucks to a power plant that can increase its pollution by that amount. This uh, system is not transparent. Uh, the deals between the credit generators and purchasers are cut by private third-party brokers who skim off the middle. The public is not part of those transactions. And it is very difficult to know whether the credits are real, like no one's measuring water quality around CAFOs to determine whether they're getting the load reductions they say they're getting that they're then turning around and selling. And so we did a report on this. It's outside called Water Quality Trading. Um, we ground truth this process because so far it's really been debated at the level of theory. And we one of our case studies was in Pennsylvania. So uh, 
in terms of credit purchasing, power plants are big proponents because they have been shifting air pollution into waterways through scrub their scrubbing processes and technologies. They don't want to upgrade their plants to treat the pollution, they just want to buy their way out of it. So this is Brunner Island in Pennsylvania. They had the sky's the limit, limit, no limit. They could discharge as much as they could afford to buy. In 2014, they discharged 78,000 pounds of nitrogen. In 2013, 87,000 pounds. They could have discharged a million pounds under their permits of nitrogen if they could have found the credits and purchased it. Power plants, of course, are often located in communities of color and low-income communities. We're going to see a lot of social justice and racist outcomes from trading. On the credit purchase side, um, in Pennsylvania, most of the credits come from the ag sector. Some, a small percentage from best management practices like the buffer strip I mentioned. Uh, the number one credit generation generator is a gasification plant. It burns poultry litter. They are financing this plant, or intend to finance this plant, based on water pollution trading credits. They are also stacking carbon credits on top of that, so they're selling carbon credits into the California cap and trade market so someone else can increase their greenhouse gases. And we know these large-scale manure to energy plants, like slaughterhouses, once you build the beasts, you have to feed it. They've got a lot of cables coming in behind to provide the feedstock. So this is going to make the concentration of cables in your communities worse, this, this market scheme. Um, the other way that they were generating credits is CAFOs were just shipping manure off-site. So most of them, was interesting, in the state were shipping them to one hay farm in western Pennsylvania, which was also in an impaired watershed and also a broker. And we asked the states for uh, information about where that broker then was sending the waste. They had no manifest system. So for all we know, it went from one side of the state to the other side and back again. So it's, you know, a shit shell game, as we call it. Pardon my French. Um, the industry knows it's a joke. Delmarva Poultry Industry, which is a lobby group for Purdue with Tyson and Mount Air and Delmarva said, look, MDA, this is a volunteer program where farmers can make money, and by farmers they mean themselves mostly, um, so that other polluters can uh, increase their pollution into the Chesapeake Bay and the tributaries. So this is, I never agree with them on anything, but their characterization of trading is spot on. It's happening in many places. Uh, when we did this report, there were 22 states that had trading programs in place or in development. Since the report, there are more states that have been added. Iowa just commented on our proposal in Missouri. And one of the disconcerting things is now, for example, in your home state of Wisconsin, they are not just allowing trading of nitrogen and phosphorus, but almost any pollutant, including known carcinogens like benzene. So, I guess I'm out of time here. So, uh, we need to fight this, right? We invite you to this fight. Uh, we need to move away from, we, we need to stop the move away from regulation to the marketplace. We know that making our waterways tradable commodities is inherently wrong, right? We know that trading away our fundamental right to clean water is inherently wrong. We know that profiting on the back of the most disenfranchised communities is inherently wrong, and we're doing all these things through trading. So we plan to establish it as illegal under the Clean Water Act. We hope that you will join us in fighting these programs from taking hold in many of the states. The good news is it's fairly new. We've got a petition outside on our table along with copies of this report because when we win our lawsuit, and we will, when we stop these programs at the state level, and we will, we know that the proponents are going to run to Congress to try to get the Clean Water Act amended and that's already happened. So we're showing up champions there. We have a national sign-on letter. We hope that you will join us in fighting. The takeaway being that the magic of the marketplace is not really magical for us, right? It's only magical for the big corporations who seek to profit off of our clean water. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Daisy Freund, and I'm with ASPCA. Um, I came into this animal welfare movement actually from a farming background, um, raising livestock in the Hudson Valley of New York, and I'm really honored to be here and excited to talk to you about AgGag. Uh, these are bills that many of you will have heard about, um, but I think that I'll hope to hopefully um, shed some light on the behind the scenes uh, coalition that has basically put a stop to them. Um, we hope to not see any more of them, we may, but really they have trickled down to zero and there's a lot to be learned in, in how that happened. Um, and, uh, and I think, you know, we've, talk, we've talked about so many abuses in this coming from the factory farming industry. 
Um, but really we're talking as well always about animal abuse. Um, I raised animals in a, a responsible way. I'm sure many of you who are farmers are doing the same. We're not talking about that in factory farms. We're talking about animals who are prevented from doing um, the most basic of their natural needs, uh, natural behaviors. Um, actually, there'll be a, a photo up here. Um, these are images from investigations and reports, and we owe a lot to animal advocates who have gone inside these farms and have provided the images that one way or another have brought a lot of us to the table. They've been some of the first images that we ever had of uh, the way that animals are being raised, um, got people's attention and caused an enormous amount of uh, outcry. Uh, people inherently understand that there's something wrong with keeping animals in this way. We're a society of animal lovers. 94% of people in our polls show that they believe that animals raised for food deserve to be free from cruelty and abuse, and that is not what is happening on these farms, and you can see it, uh, whether it's a, an act of real sadistic abuse or simply just the system as it's run. Um, you know, these are not environments that allow for animals to be animals at all. Um, and so what's come of all of these investigations that have come up in the last 20 years is a fair amount of public outcry, a lot of suppliers being dropped, major corporations having to take actions they never would have taken, uh, disavowing these kinds of practices. Um, and really, there was an opportunity there for industry to do something about the abuse that was coming out and the loss of profits that were occurring from these investigations. And they did do something, but they did not do what we hoped. Um, they started to introduce ag-gag laws. And these laws have a pretty deep history. The idea of suppressing people who are out there telling the truth um, is, is not new. In the 1990s, there were a few bills introduced that basically made it illegal to take photos or videos on farms. Um, those happened quietly in three states. But it really got underway in 2003 when the American Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC, which is essentially a corporate bill mill funded by corporate interests, they created a model bill, a model legislation to create a registry of animal and ecological terrorists. Most of you who are out there um, you know, doing the good work you're doing would count under that uh, definition. Um, and it prohibited reporting on animal facilities. In 2006, the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act was signed into law by President Bush, which was inspired by Alex's model. And then in 2010, we saw a bill in Washington that also borrowed heavily from that language um, labeling anyone who protests at an animal facility, which could be a supermarket, by the way, um, a terrorist. That bill died, but by 2011, Alec really honed that weapon down to a science, and we saw the first of, of ag bills pass. And uh, over the next four years, 30 bills were introduced in 26 states. Uh, they've had a variety of, of forms. I call this a virus because it just kept evolving. The first really just outright banned photos and videos on farms. It was an obvious First Amendment issue. The outcry was swift and uh, vicious. Some bills did pass, but um, it made the industry look so bad that they had to pull back from that and shift a little bit to make it illegal to uh, lie on an application to gain access to an agricultural facility. That meant if you you know check the box that said, I have no affiliation with an animal, an animal group of any kind, and then perhaps you were a member of the ASPCA because you had a dog. That meant you could be um, criminalized for anything that you um, said or did about that farm if you fought, saw abuses. And then finally, um, even those were obviously a First Amendment and many other um, constitutional issues came up from those. So we saw rapid reporting laws, which made it so that you had to turn over any evidence of animal abuse within 24 to 48 hours. It was very crafty, it sounded very good, uh, put us in a tough position because we are um, advocates for reporting animal abuse, but all of the investigations that have resulted in meaningful change um, on factory farms have, happened, have had to take place over many days, weeks and even months, because it takes so much evidence to, um, to charge anybody with animal cruelty. There are no laws in the books to protect farm animals. So you have to show repeated instances of neglect and cruelty and letting an animal suffer and not euthanizing that animal over two, three, four days. Um, and that's really what's caused change and that's what they were preventing here. This is the state we're in right now. Um, eight, eight bills passed, or eight ag-ag laws that were put on the books. One was rolled back um, in Idaho. 
You can see more states than not have introduced these bills. It was very much a concerted effort. So how did we manage all those uh, orange states where they were defeated? Every single one of those was, a, was an exhaustive fight. We managed it through branding this problem. One of the things that AgGag had going for it was its name. It was easy to remember, the media ran with it. We created very sharp, clear messages that we disseminated, um, we being the coalition of groups fighting these bills. Things like, it makes ag look like they have something to hide. You're shooting the messenger. This is un-American, this is unconstitutional. Keeping it really short and clear and branded. Um, we had an amazing coalition. Sorry, so here's a little bit of the media that came out about AgGag. Um, there was also an element of, of humor, of absolute absurdity to this. The Daily Show covered AgGag and Al Madrigal said, so let me get this straight, you're protecting the animals from the people that are trying to protect the animals. And it just was, that, that's what the whole thing was. It was totally absurd. Um, so I recommend using humor whenever you can. These are just a few of the amazing groups that uh, joined together. There's a, a coalition letter, which really brought us all together online. More than 80 national interest groups, religious groups, civil liberties groups, uh, photographers, media. People really understood that this was a problem because of the outreach that was done to frame this in all of their different interests. Um, and I would say the most effective advocates on this issue were farmers. Um, people who came to these uh, legislative sessions who, who testified and said, we have nothing to hide, we find this insulting, this is bad for our industry, bad for our brand. Um, we also use social media to our advantage. We, uh, the ASPCA launched something called Open the Barns, it's still up there. If you're a farmer, if you're a rural advocate, I um, encourage you to post pictures of uh, what it looks like to you to have an open farm. Um, if you have nothing to hide, show photos of your animals. If you're fighting a CAFO, um, you know, talk about what you're really trying to expose. That's our Kendra over there, um, talking about having nothing, responsible farmers have nothing to hide. Um, we use celebrities, so in North Carolina, um, we took to social media and tweeted at all the celebrities who had houses in the state um, and had them tweet at the governor in North Carolina. Unfortunately, he vetoed the bill anyway, but uh, he was completely inundated. Um, thank you, Martha Stewart and Kesha. <laughs> um, and then eventually, we got it got so bad that the industry itself opposed AgAg. -Ag. Um, Temple said it was the stupidest thing AgAg had ever done. Uh, we had a bunch of farmers unions speak up, and this was a particularly sassy quote that I'm sure this will do wonders for agribusiness's image. Um, we also were pretty strategic in different states where there was a, a new um, investment by a company. So um, Chobani, and, for example, in Idaho, had just invested heavily into a new dairy facility, and we had um, advocates tweeting at Chobani's CEO until he eventually opposed the bill and spoke to the, the governor. Um, so what's next? Uh, if anyone has any questions about this, please ask me, I'm running out of time. But um, there are a number of legal challenges. There, we're suing in North Carolina. There's a challenge in Wyoming with a particular bill that's kind of an ag-gag. It um, uh, a, a prevents you from gathering data in open space, including um, testing water. Um, we're seeing that ag-gag is trickling down. It's just sort of poisoned to be associated with a bill that could be called ag-gag, but so they're they're shifting shape a little bit again, where there are um, broad bans on recording in North Carolina. It's not specific to ag, so somebody who saw uses at an elderly um, home would, would also be criminalized for taking those images. Totally ridiculous. Um, we're also seeing some anti-sunshine laws uh, coming in, like in Missouri. And most of all, we are seeing that the next front of ag, ag because they failed so hard, is um, right to farm. So I'll pass that off now. Thank you, uh, Danny, for inviting me here today. I'm Loka Aish, but as was mentioned, I am a rural sociologist at Auburn University, a land grant out of the College of Agriculture there. <laughs> Delighted to be here. I um, actually grew up in rural Illinois on a farm where my family farms still today. Um, I'm going to be talking today about right to farm laws. What they are, something I didn't know about until about five years ago when they came on my radar as a very important issue for family farmers and rural Americans all together throughout the country. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about what they are. So right to farm laws really are a response to the Fifth Amendment. Um, so really a response to one of the strongest premises of American democracy, the right to private property. 
So the Fifth Amendment, to quote, says that nor shall any person be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. So for um, confined animal feeding operations, this Fifth Amendment is a fundamental problem for their operations. So if you are a private property owner who lives beside a confined animal feeding operation, you are facing the loss of the enjoyment of your property for a variety of reasons, which means that you are entitled constitutionally to file suit, to file what is known as a nuisance suit. So the um, CAFO owners would counter, as you kind of see in this very simplistic formula, that they should have the freedom to develop their property. So in, in an effort to make money, that they should be able to build one of these facilities as part of their private property rights. But in the courts, um, there is a, a general tendency over the past 20 years for neighbors to be winning these suits because it's akin to an unfair taking of property without any compensation. So it's a taking of your capacity to sit on your back porch, for example, and breathe the fresh air. It's a taking of a capacity for you to resell your property if you want to in the event that that happens. So there is no just compensation. So in essence, in this kind of a situation, it's a violation of the Fifth Amendment unless you're receiving just compensation. So in response to this problem, uh, right to farm laws came up across the United States and have evolved dramatically, as I mentioned, particularly over the last 20 years. So proponents are advocating these laws predominantly by saying that they are helping rural communities by protecting farm families from frivolous nuisance suits predominantly rendered by urban neighbors who come into the countryside and are not familiar with agriculture. So they perhaps don't like seeing, I, um, you may have heard narratives like this, they don't like seeing a dead calf out in the pasture that wasn't collected, or they just start used to a slight smell of manure. So this battle is ongoing right now in places like Oklahoma, where there's a constitutional amendment proposed 777, which um, those who are fighting this have made akin to the mark of the beast, 666. But in this case, it's actually a constitutional amendment to say that the agricultural industry is predominantly saying that we need a constitutional amendment that says that the right to farm is alongside of the right to freedom of speech, alongside the right to the freedom of religion. So this is on the ballot right now. So it's happening across the country. But what I want to really point to is that it already has happened um, quite dramatically. These laws go by very many, by a lot of different names. In my home state of Alabama, it's currently called the Alabama Family Farm Preservation Act. So in your state, it might not be called right to farm. In other places, like in Wisconsin, in Wisconsin, it's just simply entitled nuisances. So it's not called right to farm. So when you're looking for it, don't necessarily think it's gonna be under that title. But what I wanna to stress today is that there's already right to farm legislation in existence on the books in every state in the country. So whether that's Hawaii, Alaska, Vermont, Oregon, California, and any state that you're from, if you're from the United States, there's some type of this legislation that's on the books. So what I'm gonna talk about specifically, I don't have a lot of time, is we're just in the very initial phases of analysis of this project, and I'm not a lawyer, but luckily I'm working with some very smart lawyers, including Danielle Diamond and Lisa Pruitt, who's a professor of law at the University of California, Davis, another way of it. <laughs> So just throwing that in there. Um, these are some of our initial findings. This is gonna be a four-year project. I'm talking off of a summer of research. So I don't have a lot to give you. I'm just gonna hit some high points. But the first myth that right to farm laws and proponents are advocating is that these facilities protect the family farm. Most blatantly from a rural sociology perspective, there's nothing in any of these laws, not in one state in the United States that explicitly says we are only protecting family farm. It includes anything like family ownership, family labor, family ownership of land or animals. There's nothing that says these laws are just specific to family farm operations. So a second myth that is on the books is that these laws are just protecting farms or agricultural operations that were there first. Now that's commonly something you'll hear at the town hall meetings. Well, you weren't there first. You're, you built your house in an area that always was agricultural. Are your, this farm predated whoever you may be as a resident? In actuality, there's only 14% um, of states currently that have something on the books, and it's these yellow states that I have highlighted in this map. These, this 14% of states, these includes Montana, Nebraska, Ohio, Oregon, Vermont, West Virginia, and Wyoming, 
These are the only states in the country that say that the farm and agricultural operation had to be there first. So if any of you in the room are from those states, those are ones where unless it was there first, if, if it was there first, you cannot sue, but otherwise you can. Now this is a minority of states in the United States, but I really want to point to the states that are in red. So this is 44% of the states in the United States. This is including Alabama, Arkansas, Connecticut, Delaware, Florida, Georgia, Idaho, Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, Louisiana, Maryland, Massachusetts, Mississippi, Missouri, North Carolina, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Tennessee that has a one year limitation on when you can sue. So if one of these facilities came in and has been in operation for one year, you cannot sue for it as being a nuisance. So that's a, a, a major limitation. So it doesn't matter if your family farm goes back five generations, four generations. Um, if that facility came in and has had animals running in through it for a year, you cannot sue. So in efforts for time, I, I'll just briefly go, go through these in a little less detail. Blue states, there's only two of them. That means if it's been in operation two years or more, you can't sue. Green, three years or more, you can't sue. Purple, six years or more, and in an ag zone, you can't sue. And lastly, I just want to point to Wisconsin, which is unique of any states in the country, which means if it's any sort of agricultural operation, doing any kinds of agriculture that predates you living in that, in that area, you cannot sue. So it's a confusing statute because if it once had grass-fed cattle, and now it has a confined animal feeding operation. Those both constitute agriculture, so you cannot sue. So it's almost the worst in the nation in this particular category. Okay, the third myth, and the final one that I'm gonna focus on today, is that um, these statutes give governance back to rural people. And you hear a lot of that rhetoric in the news that urbanites are taking over rural areas or people with urban sorts of values are coming into rural America and they just don't know about agriculture. So this is a way to give the rights back to farmers, rights back to rural people to take control over what's happening um, in the government. And this is a very compelling line of logic because rural people are increasingly poor, increasingly targeted for whatever industries, and this kind of rhetoric really resonates. But I want to point that for the most part, this is a myth. So 62% of states and current right to farm laws actually have to some degree a removal of local governance. And in 23 states, the 46% that are in red, this is a complete removal of any capacity at the municipal or the county level to pass a law that prohibits certain types of industrial animal facilities or otherwise, you just can't do it, period. So those states, I'm not gonna list off this time, but they're in red. So that's 23 states. In 16% of states, if you are zoned as an agricultural area, you cannot pass any kind of ordinance to um, prevent the building of any kind of facility. So those are in blue and that's 16% of states. But I do want to point out, for those of you in the room that are in the clear zone, there are the 24% of states, there's 12 of them, that don't have any of this sort of removal of local governance on the, book, on the books. Watch out and keep it from happening there. So if there's, those states do not explicitly say that you cannot pass an ordinance if you're in the clear zone. So on this note, what I'm doing today is not trying to just make you depressed or make this seem like it's inevitable, it's already there, it can't be changed. My, my project and my work with Danny and others is really to show where are we right now? What's the groundwork nationally so we can understand what the trends are in right to farm laws right now? Our next step, and we're also working with um, three different law schools out of University of Arkansas, University of Nebraska, and as I mentioned, University of California Davis, as well as Danny and, Danny and SRAP. And we're gonna be working to come up with model legislation that actually serves family farms in rural communities and revising these laws on a state-by-state -state basis in addition to just providing the information of what they are. So those are our next steps that we're gonna be working on. A lot of people out there, Dan. You never going to be so many. So anyway, um, I'm not the most polished speaker in the world, but uh, I think I have a pretty good sense of right and wrong. And I think uh, today I'm looking at the right people, and I think today uh, we're in the right place. So, uh, give yourself a hand.
ask you to talk about trends in agriculture and why are we seeing this insane expansion of CAFOs. Um, and my background is I was a former contract poultry producer for Purdue Farms. And uh, we had a um, kind of public battle uh, about two years ago. And so uh, after 23 years, I just terminated my own contract, you know, left on my own terms, dignity intact. So it's always been a kind of a... <laughs> it never was really a good business. I'm thinking about you using into our cycles. But it, you, know, you can't walk away from three quarters of a million dollar debt when you got everything hot. But there's direct benefits from, from uh, like public policy. I have a general who was talking about farm bill. Uh, cost share programs uh, certainly help uh, the, the industry kind of cut their costs down. Uh, you have the indirect benefits, which certainly being able to buy grain for less than the cost of production has got to be good for the uh, the bottom line somewhere. Then the what I call the virtual subsidy, and that's kind of mostly why we're here today. It's uh, the, uh, the virtual subsidy, something you can't quite put a finger or a dollar fig uh, figure on it, and it's the pollution of your waters, uh, the polarization of communities. Just uh, every community I've ever been in working and I just started with this rap is really polarizing and it's, it's almost disturbing. And then there's that burden of risk. They say that the, you know the farmers insulate from risk. I don't say they insulate from risk when you are uh, borrowed against everything you own and uh, you know, plants shut down, even influenza, I mean you, you could go bankrupt in a hurry. But the thing that I think the worst thing is is what I see is it keeps the a constant supply of farmers uh, in line to with poultry houses is FSA guaranteed loans. Um, I'm on the East Coast, and so all my experience here is, is with poultry, and, and to a lesser extent, a contract board. If you take a chicken contract to a farm credit or whatever, and you say, "Hey, man, I'm gonna borrow a million and a half dollars in my contract," that or that bank is gonna slide it right back to you. He's gonna deny you. He's gonna suggest you that apply for an FSA loan. You do. You'll probably get approved. You go back to the same banker, well, he's just removed 90% of his skin out of the game, so if they love it. And, um, you know, to me, if it's such a tag on good business, why does it need to be guaranteed? Why does not it stand on its own? I mean, you're talking about a million, billion and a half dollar industry that you have to get uh, cost share guaranteed, and the things that become so expensive now, they had to go through to the SBA because the cap's higher than the, than the FSA. So, So I've got, I've got another section here, I call it Neon Promises and Half-Truths, which uh, my grandmother always told me the half-truth was the worst lie of all because of deception. These things are presented, these CAFOs, as modern agriculture and the future, and this is just my personal opinion, but I think I can, there's enough to, uh, evidence to back it up. The system is incompatible with a sustainable system. I can't imagine being able to get grain yields at, at the same pace as animal agriculture is growing. Something somewhere, the line's the line going across and something's got to give. If we were to sit down and draw up a, a food system, I think what we have now would probably be the last thing on the list. Uh, we, would, we would do it in a better and more equitable way. Uh, the companies come in and they infiltrate these uh, poor communities. And, and they'll start a bid war with them. They'll have, you know, just to see what they can get out of them. And then they come in with the promise of jobs, uh, most of them the revolving door jobs, um, and an increased tax base. Well, if you go back to those benefits, the direct benefits from farm policy, I figured up on a farm in Maryland that's brand new, they were going to get $14,000 uh, property tax back to the county. And well, before they put the first chicken on that farm, they're going to have 100 grand in cost share. Um, taxpayer money on that farm, so it's, the net effect is they're losing eighty-six thousand dollars, and, and, and there's the, the, the direct benefits keep right on. And there's a, a list of mile long. I wish I, I had done a PowerPoint and then put them up, but there, there's a lot of them. You know, they, this, the interest comes so consolidated, it's really tilted the wheel against becoming an independent farmer. Um, if a farmer wants to go into the livestock these days, most likely he's going to be able to cave. I mean, it, 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 it takes a lot of Guts to go out as the independent now. 
the industry promises these farmers that they're insulated from risk um, and a steady income and technical support and, and guide you and veterinary service. Well, I, most of that to me, I, I saw very little of and it really didn't benefit me. But the one thing that's, that's true is steady income because I grossed in 2000, the same thing I grossed in 2016, you can draw a straight line. That's not what I thought what steady income meant, but it, that, that, there is truth there. Um, <laughs> The industry is scouring the globe, man. We're, we're seeing um, lots of, uh, I think it's Koreans and Vietnamese. And the reason they're coming over here to, to build poultry farms is somebody gave me a, a Korean newspaper and they were advertising for poultry, um, Korea, uh, people who are interested in poultry farming on the eastern shore of Maryland. So that they're, they're, they're flipping every rock they can. I was wondering if the, the pool of farmers is dwindling. I saved my favorite for the last. That CAFOs is the only way we can feed the world. I mean, y'all heard that at least one time. I don't see any way, again, that grain production can keep up with the way the animal production is growing. So, if you think about it, the industrial system is in place now. We're not feeding the world now. So, how, how is it going to cure problems down the road when there's one and two billion more people? I don't think there's any magic fairy dust out there that we can put a sprinkle on it and make it happen. It's just not sustainable. So how do we reverse the trend? I mean, you can vote with your fork. There are farmers out there that are independent of Terry Spence is here, Chris Peterson. And it's kind of a mini trend, but don't think the companies hadn't looked at that. I mean, Purdue has just bought Neiman Ranch, and they are also the biggest uh, organic producer of chicken in the United States. And we're really isn't that much different than what I was doing other than the feed. So they, they just moved into that model very quickly. But we've got to uh, we've got to work on these policies to kind of kind of level the field where a farmer can come in and independent and compete. Because they the, the, the policies really do support the KFO model. So how do we do that? You have to come to the workshop and I'm at it about three o'clock this afternoon. <laughs> I'm gonna let that out of time. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. I'm sitting up here. These are my colleagues. I work with some of you almost on a daily basis and listening to everybody give their presentations, I just I'm in awe. Just the work that you do. It's an honor to have these minds and leaders up here. So now we have about 15 minutes left with our time. I want to walk around the room and have, um, if anyone has any questions for the speakers, I want to run around and get as many questions answered as we can. And so I don't know if the best way to handle this is to go by speaker or just go by questioner. <laughs> we'll start with questioner and see how that works. of 
animal welfare from many other issues has been um, really disruptive and the fact that AGAG in particular brought so many groups together with animal advocacy uh, was a silver lining because um, we should all be standing together and this idea that you know loving animals or caring about how animals are treated as radical is um, divisive and very much seated by the industry. It's not radical at all. Um, so yes, I, I hope that um, all of you will think of the animal advocacy community in your local fights um, and call on us and get my card and, and we will try to help whenever we can. We have um, tens of thousands of, of members in every state. We have three million members across the country. Um, and they think of themselves as loving dogs and cats, but when we send them an email about chickens, they respond. Um, we have been working on the poultry industry. We, we launched a campaign a while ago called Truth About Chicken. Craig was involved with, um, with Compassion in World Farming. They have a campaign called the Better Chicken Initiative. Uh, there are a number of, of groups now working to reform the poultry industry and to get them to slow down growth rates, give chickens more room, uh, natural light, um, and a number of other reforms. So um, we work with Food and Water Watch. We're interested in, in working in Maryland in particular. Um, wherever we can, we'd like to be messaging about the way that animal welfare um, is affected negatively right alongside public health and the environment. And, and what that does is it brings new people into the fight where maybe they don't really understand the environmental issue, they don't understand the public health issue, they may be activated by the animal issue. Um, and Open the Barns also is something that um, absolutely you can apply to poultry. Um, so please, you know, just get in touch with me and we'll try to help on a, on a local level. But all of this is national and all, for all species. Yeah, and we are actually actively coordinating in, in Maryland right now um, with the ASPCA, with Food and Water Watch and others. Yeah. Yes, I have a question about uh, pollution, animal abuse. Um, sometimes I imagine that I live in a country where uh, pollution of our waterways and abuse of our animals is actually against the law. And um, I wonder if it were really against the law and uh, uh, people who commit the crime are being assisted by others uh, in facilitating the crime. Let's say, uh, you know, uh, CAPOs are generally contracted operations. Um, then uh, I wonder if any of you have explored with attorneys in your organizations the possibility of bringing a RICO case uh, uh, against uh, farmer against the uh, CAFO operators and their uh, the people with whom they contract, or the fertilizer companies and uh, uh, and those who apply the fertilizer. Uh, RICO is a racketeering uh, law uh, that. Uh, was adopted by the federal government, I think, back in the 70s, and about 33 states have similar laws. We have not, uh, is Rick here still, or Larry? Didn't Waterkeeper Alliance attend, work with some lawyers, or Bobby work with some lawyers a while ago to try to file a RICO case that was unsuccessful ultimately, but I don't remember the details of that. Is there anything that you would want to say about that? And I don't know if Water Cooper Lines is still... Uh, about eight years, maybe ten years ago, there were a collection of great lawyers all across the country that joined with Bobby Kennedy. Uh, it was outside Waterkeeper, but I mean, it was Bobby Kennedy and a lot of people at Waterkeeper and a lot of lawyers supported uh, Waterkeeper that brought a RICO suit against the industry, the whole industry, brought it down in Florida. And whether it was because um, some filings were wrong or, uh, or it just couldn't be done, the judge in the Florida court threw it out. And they even tried to sanction the lawyers who brought the case, and did, but then the sanctions were overturned or appealed. Um, frankly, I, I, I'm an attorney. I look at the law. I think it applies. I think it should have worked, but it didn't. But because of the outcome of that case, everyone else has been reluctant to try it again. But maybe it will happen. 
But the answer to your question is, I do think it applies, because I do think that the Racketeer Influence and Corrupt uh, uh, Act of uh, Crimes it, it, it is, is a law that applies to what's going on in that industry. And uh, I don't think, in my mind, there's no question about that. So maybe it'll happen again. It's a great question. Uh, it's been tried, and so far it hasn't worked. Just along the same lines as the last gentleman brought up, it's been very interesting watching the lawsuit of the Des Moines water utility against the upstream water districts in Iowa um, with the Raccoon River because they're, they get all their drinking water from the Raccoon River and the Raccoon River has been more and more heavily polluted even though supposedly the volunteer efforts of all the farmers in the area are supposedly addressing the issue, it's obviously not. So could, maybe the gentleman just talked, but can someone address that? I'm just curious. I mean, water utilities starting to sue farming districts for polluted water. Can anyone comment on that? Yeah, it's an exciting lawsuit. Bill Stowe is the water works director there who's um, courageously filed a lawsuit. And he frankly just fed up, right? Des Moines has one of the most expensive nitrate filters in the world because their um, you know, waterways are being polluted by agriculture. And, and we know Iowa, as we heard earlier, is a big at CAFO state. Um, so he sued upstream drainage ditches. And his argument generally is that under the Clean Water Act, those should be regulated and be permitted because the Clean Water Act regulates point sources or those discrete conveyances, in this case, man-made drainage ditches that are designed to funnel water and pollutants within it you know, off-site into, into waterways from land. So um, it is a case of first impression. There's a lot of excitement around it. Even if he loses, he's really changed the conversation in Iowa about whether there's the appropriate regulation of agriculture. And um, so, yeah, stay tuned. It's a good set case. Hey, Elizabeth Haddix from North Carolina, and I'm at the Center for Civil Rights. Just in response to the question about RICRA, um, I see that there is a panel here with, in, the, in, in the track three at 225 with Eli Holmes and Charlie Spear, um, who have, along with public justice, have been doing a lot of the groundbreaking work um, with RICRA for a long time. But I just want to say too, and maybe we'll talk about this on that panel, there, there are lots of, uh, lots, there, there are several laws that we think can be used creatively to address um, both the pollution, the, the environmental degradation piece of this, um, the sort of corporate uh, conspiracy and, and racketeering piece, but also the environmental justice piece. Um, and so, you know, the Fair Housing Act is one of those. Um, there, there are tort claims, there's Section 1981. There's, there's lots of possibility here, so we're looking forward to looking at those. Yeah, there's a panel this afternoon. We're going to hear from practitioners about the Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, some creative strategies, and the use of RICRA, as was mentioned, that's our hazardous waste laws. And then you're going to hear also some efforts between lawyers, community members, and health professionals to establish health-based ordinances, which are not zoning ordinances and have been used successfully in states where local control is limited in some way. So that's this afternoon. Any other questions? Runoff into our streams. 
So I don't necessarily see that as a bad thing. It seems like the question is, what's bad? Yeah, so the inherent problem with trading is someone's allowed to, tr to pollute more that shouldn't be polluting, right? So like, like I was saying, there's this rollback where traditional sources, power plants, wastewater treatment plants, etc., who are supposed to be um, operating under permits that require mandatory reductions are now have an off-ramp, right? So that's the bad thing about trading. Someone always gets to pollute more. In terms of agriculture, it's being pitched as something new and innovative, but it's really not. For decades, we've been throwing money in agriculture through the Farm Bill and other programs, and it's voluntary, and it's cost share money, and, we, and agriculture still remains the number one cause of water quality impairment in our country. So I think there needs to be a movement, and I, I have a lot of people in this room are working on this, right, where, you know, PFOS need to be regulated in the same way that our other point sources have been regulated, regulated with mandatory um, requirements to reduce their pollution. Um, when it comes to non kfos if those are a problem in your, your uh, state, we also hear that you know, there's no authority under the Clean Water Act to regulate other sources of agricultural pollution. And while the Clean Water Act doesn't do as well with, with what's called the non-point sector and the non kfos states have the authority under the Clean Water Act today to be more stringent than federal law when required to protect their waterways. And so I think that the, the answer is everyone has to do their part. It shouldn't be that some people have to do their part so someone else gets off the hook, right? Um, so it's great that farmers are being brought into the mix in Wisconsin, but really, you know, these voluntary schemes where they're incentivized through financial means haven't, haven't ever worked well without some, you know, the mandatory requirements and some, you know, accountability for those pollution reductions. So I think that's all the time that we have for questions, but if you do have follow-up questions, track these guys down. <laughs> They'll be running around. Uh, thank you so much. I think we're gonna do, uh, should I turn this over to you?